Hello and welcome to the CX Files podcast. I'm your host, Mark Hillary. Michael DeSalis is a principal analyst on the North American customer care team at Frost & Sullivan. Frost is one of the biggest and most recognized industry analysts, so this is a great opportunity to hear Michael's views on the industry at present. Michael recently published an article that explored how the business process outsourcing and contact center industry is reacting to the COVID-19 pandemic. He also sketched out a roadmap for the industry to 2021. I called him to ask about the article and what he thinks we might expect as this industry heads into 2021. Michael, in a recent blog that you published um, about how BPOs are handling COVID-19, you said uh, BPOs are taking an all-hands-on-deck approach to education, communication, and protection. I mean, you said that they're being very positive and proactive and tackling this very aggressively. So uh, since you wrote that, which I guess is a few weeks ago now, uh, what's your most recent observation on how the BPOs are handling this crisis? Well, let me, let me put it in perspective, if I could, Mark. So, so first and foremost, what I found out really didn't surprise me. Um, as you know, I've been tracking activity and developments in this market for the last 15 years. So because BPOs are almost completely dependent on, and in my mind, really care about the well-being of their people, they were and they are now just really being proactive and aggressive, focus on employee health and safety, while at the same time, and this was the difficult part, deploying business continuity plans to meet their individual client needs. So there were really two constituencies that they had to look after. Now, what makes it interesting to look at is that many of the companies have tens of thousands of agents. Some have hundreds of thousands of agents, not only in the U.S., but all over the world. So it kind of hit them in a way I'd call fast and furious, forgive the cliche, but they had very little time to plan and execute. So what I saw earlier is what I'm continuing to see now, a focus on well-being, safety, and making sure that clients' um, requirements are being satisfied. Okay, yeah, and that's interesting. You said that they had to take action. They didn't have much time. Clearly, work from home was one of the major reactions that that kept everybody going. Um, But do you see that now becoming a permanent feature? And, and, And how does that affect the business model? So I I would tell you in a short answer, yes. I think that they're already there. This, what makes it again interesting is this transition to work at home has been very, very successful. So here's what I've seen, three surprising things. First, agents that have always worked in a contact center and never worked from home, I think really started to enjoy the work and family balance, right? And the flexibility. And then as, on top of that, they've got now a five minute commute from the bedroom to the workspace, not to mention the savings and transportation costs and the real positive effect on the environment, which is important to this group of millennials and even younger generations. Second, the key performance indicators that you and I you know, have been tracking for a long time, speed of answer, handle time, after call work and hold time, For every BPO exec that I have talked to and continue to talk to, they're beating expectations for NPS, for customer satisfaction scores. And what this does is it positions BPOs to take on more volumes with better outcomes. And then finally, I think BPOs realize really quickly that now they have the opportunity to shed expensive real estate costs and pass those on to to their clients. So I would say all in all, it's a really good news story. And I think bottom line, it means that BPOs can now offer clients, albeit virtual, another geo to choose from. Yeah, that, that's really interesting, um, especially around the, the cost there, the office leases. I mean, another cost that, that they've had to sort of just accept during the crisis was the, the equipment, the laptops. Mm. But, do you, but do you think that we're going to see um, bring your own device and, and trends like that taking off in future or, or are people wary of security? That's a great question. So as that pandemic kind of spread, market immediately kind of became serious and a costly challenge, you know, deliver physical devices, laptops and computers, maybe even iPads for the supervisors. But check this out. I have a great story. In my research on this major shift, I found this small software company called ThinScale, and they're based in Ireland. And what I discovered is that ThinScale for a long time has been a leader in architecting and delivering software solutions 
that help organizations to effectively implement and manage their remote working, right? And BYODs and business continuity strategies. Okay, and their thin scale. So what they've got then is a software-based, Windows-based um, solution that enables existing hardware, bring your own device, owned by either the organization or the user that can be converted into a secure, flexible, centrally managed thin client, right? So instead of shipping laptops and PCs, here's how it works. It's called Thin Kiosk. And again, it's software only, but it repurposes an existing Windows device into a Windows-based thin client. So this way the agents use their home laptop, not from the company necessarily, for working on client applications during their shift. And then the computer is placed in a, a worker mode, let's say, right? So at this point, then the lockdown policies are applied. It's almost like a lockdown device. No USB ports, no printing. So Windows Explorer is removed and this secure remote workspace interface is launched. It's secure. And so when the shift is over, the Asian employee can toggle back to personal use. I, I think it's fairly brilliant. Yeah, I mean, that, that sounds much better than the, the typical kind of USB stick that, that they oh. often mail out, you know? A absolutely. Actually, I, I will tell you, it's, we found it so compelling that we recognized ThinScale with the 2020 Enabling Technology Leadership Award in the contact software industry. It's, it's that compelling. Okay, well, and I mean, on that subject then, mm. um, of security and the agents being distributed and based at home, um, I haven't heard of any major data breaches in the industry mm. at all, but this all happened really fast. So right. do, you th do you think that the, there was a risk or that the BPOs have addressed it now? I would agree with you. I haven't heard any data breaches either, but there's always risk. I mean, you know I write about contact center security a lot, and as you can imagine, BPO clients across industry verticals are really extremely concerned about how companies use their data and how they track their activities online. I'd submit this to you, Mark, that within either a captive or an outsourced contact center, agent fraud really represents probably the most significant and pernicious security threat because these are people you've hired, you've vetted. You don't expect them to be a security threat, right? And one of the most common actions that they do in contact center across the globe is when employees conduct unauthorized access to private and confidential data. Sometimes it's a criminal act. Sometimes it's innocent. If they do it without the authorization, there's no business need to access that data. So again, here comes ThinScale. They developed this tool called Secure Remote Worker. And this came out of the demand for a secure bring your own device option that could work on user agent or agent owned devices. So once they're logged into this tool, the user can only access the interface where the IT folks have control, right? And once they're finished, the user exits the secure remote worker and all the device restrictions are lifted, giving the user back full control of the local device. So it helps a great deal from an administrative standpoint. If an agent has the intention to commit fraud, they probably will. But the beauty of this kind of security control is you get easy and fast deployment and I'm talking about four minutes, right? You remove all the logistical complexities and here's what you get at the tail end of it. You get PCI, HIPAA and GDPR compliance. And that, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's incredibly useful because as you said, if an agent wants to join a company, maybe like a, a medical insurance company to access celebrity yeah. medical records or something, Right. And, you know, it's very easy to do it if they really want to. But I guess with this kind of tech you're talking about, you can just prevent access to anything the agent doesn't need to know. Absolutely. Part of that too, Mark, just another quick comment is you have to have a culture of security within the organization, right? And you have to, in some cases, you have to prosecute individuals to the full extent of the law to send a shot across the bow so everybody gets it, right? I will say this too. And, and this was part of the shift is clients, some of them had big concerns about work at home, right? And they were really uneasy about Waha. But now they may not have as much choice. So we're not finding as much resistance today, uh, you know, against Waha because it's very successful. 
Yeah, yeah, and and you mentioned it in your paper as part of the future. I mean, clearly there's oh, yes. there, and there's other elements such as artificial intelligence, chatbots, automation, okay. work from home. I mean, how do you see this playing out as we move into 2021? I mean, amazingly, we're already in Q4 now. Right, right. For me, I see an even greater use of AI automation. You know, is what you call a. a, a it has to be put in the context of extraordinary consumer expectations, right? And those will continue well past the next year. And consumers are, you know this, more empowered and knowledgeable than ever before. So those expectations for excellent customer service, sales knowledge, technical support have really soared. And so more and more customers are insisting that business anticipate their every need. That requires a different technology that gives you predictable outcomes. So without going into any great detail, generally speaking, these technologies are working together to give contact center managers, executives, quick and increasingly real-time access to information about their world, which used you know, to require teams of analysts to generate. So what this does now is support personalized communication with clients. It's the rapid development of new products to meet rapidly changing market demand, right? It's kind of this line of sight access to performance of the business units, and I think a whole lot more. Thanks for listening to the CX Files podcast. Peter and I would really appreciate it if you could leave a comment or rating on your podcast app, because that really helps other people to find the podcast. If you want to suggest a future guest, then just find one of us on LinkedIn and send a message.